Crossroads Media. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Sports Talk with Broads. So, Howie Roseman stays quiet at the deadline. I'm a little surprised. Yeah, I mean, look, I wanted him to go make a big splash. And I'll expand more on that as we get into the show. But not even getting marginally better is strange. I did an entire radio show with I don't want Howie Roseman being Dave Dombrowski as my topic. I didn't want Tanner Banks. I didn't want Austin Hayes. I don't want Howie to do the equivalent of Dave. We didn't get anything, right? Not only did he not do that, he sat on his hands while the NFC improved. The Lions were always going to get help on the D-line, especially after the injury to Hutchinson. It was pretty known that Washington was interested in trying to upgrade with secondary help. They got some big-time pop. And it makes me wonder, why did Howie not react? Why did Howie stay put? Is it as simple as the asking price for the larger names in Crosby and Garrett, who didn't get moved anyway, was it too high to make the impact that I wanted Howie to make? And maybe the answer is, yeah, maybe those teams didn't want to give up on that type of roster player. You know, like, I get that too. Did he feel comfortable with the way the team was built in the offseason, though? Does he believe in what's here to go win a Super Bowl, even with the new faces that went to some of these NFC teams? And by the way, Arizona got some help. How much does he believe in what's here to do it as is? Clearly enough, right? If you and Howie Roseman sitting in your living room on the couch and you're able to ask him any questions about this team, And he's on a lie detector test that won't allow him to lie. It's like the movie Liar, Liar. The pen is blue. The pen is blue. The goddamn pen is blue. And if you don't know what that reference is, please go YouTube it. And if you asked, Howie, what does Nick Sirianni do? <laughs> I'm sure we'd get a great answer to that, no? <laughs> oh, God, I'm a jerk off. All right. But in reality, it's, let's try and get this thing back on the rails here. If you could ask him, do you believe... In this team, to win a championship as is, I think he would say yes. In an NFC that doesn't have Pat Mahomes, go look at the face of Baker Mayfield the second he realized, I'm not touching the ball. We should have went for fucking two. He knew it right then and there. You don't have to deal with that threat in the NFC. So did he sit on his hands because he feels comfortable with this team? And that would kind of bother me. That would bother me. This is basic standard general manager philosophies. When your team is in the mix legitimately, you add. And don't tell me he didn't have X, Y, and Z to do something. No, come on. It's Howie Roseman. The guy gets complex out his ass. He finds third, fourth, fifth rounders 
Every day, every day, he could find ways to get more picks down the road. That's what he does. He's savvy as hell. He trades back on draft day. He picks up other pieces nonstop. It is free flow with the picks left and right, north and south with how he has a GM. He has what it takes. Maybe not to automatically go get the big fish, but to do something. So to do nothing means there's potentially a world where he does view this squad as championship caliber and did nothing to help them. Doesn't that kind of piss you off? What, Dotson? Is he going to reflect back to Dotson and say, we did add, we did it earlier? One, that ain't enough. Two, you didn't add at the deadline. And you got fleeced, kind of, in that deal. And we might have got fleeced with the Bryce Huff deal. Yo, the fact that they're acting as if a defensive lineman got a hand injury in warm-ups and then didn't play? Come on, dude. That doesn't happen. That's probably actually one of the laziest excuses I've seen from an organization in NFL history. I mean, it could be that bad of an excuse when you really think about it. Bryce Huff hurt his hand in pregame warmups. When has that ever stopped a defensive lineman of putting on the cleats and going to rush the damn quarterback? I'm sniffing BS. I'm sniffing something similar to the N'Kobe Dean experience. They were trying to move him. I just don't know if the league valued him the way that Howie valued him. And now it's like, uh-oh. And I'm not giving him away for a seventh. You think he's getting folk? Hey, that Bryce Hall fella. I know you don't like the way uh, he's, uh, you know, kind of entered the, uh, the, the, the Eagles organization here. I'll take him off your hands. Here's a seventh. Here's a sixth. And then Howie would rightfully decline. But they were trying to shop. And that's how I know that maybe there were thoughts and then they didn't execute anything. So why? Is it because they tried and then struck out? Is it because they weren't really as involved as they should have been? But even if you strike out, something has to be there. Something that you're willing to take a chance on that wouldn't destroy your organization for years, but enough to still say to the locker room, hi, boys, let's go. I got you a little sweetener. Let's have at it. You didn't even get a little bit of sweetener. Is that weird? Yeah. So if it is weird, maybe there's reasons why, and we should give... Howie Roseman, the benefit of the doubt. (laughs) Never. Never. Please. All right, so listen. We got some anytime hotline calls to react to. A lot of thoughts still about the head coach. I'm looking forward to, uh, to taking those calls. Before we get into that, though, you know my friends at Garage Beer are the best people on planet earth they have the best beer on earth is there a better combination than best people best beer uh no drinkgaragebeer.com zero percent ipa a hundred percent light beer a thousand percent quality and also by the way if you are new to the channel hello welcome on in we break down philly sports every day here at broads media so You can subscribe, you can hit that thumbs up button, that helps out tremendously, and you can take me on the road with you by going to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, your podcasting platforms, you can leave a five-star rating and a review on those platforms, and that will help out as well. I love you guys to death, you know that. All right, so why don't we just run on over to your calls, and let's kick this thing into gear. Bro. Yo, this is like the day after for me, after that uh, Eagles win. All I can say is that this team, I think, is as good as we hoped they would be. How about that offense, dude? I Listen, 
I, I got some tingly feelings watching Saquon do whatever the hell that was, yo. That's all I'm saying. No, no diddy, okay? But hear me out, though. Cooper DeGene and that Quinion Mitchell, our defense is baller, man. Eight points stolen by the referees. So what, they drop, like, give him, like, 14 on Jacksonville, fine. Offense should have scored 37. But Nick Seriani! Man, like, I, I've tried to be nice to him. i try to give him grievance. Time and time again, he's taken my patience and slammed it on the ground. Get out! Get out! Go Bears, y'all. E-A-D-L, yes, Eagles. Have a good one, bro. Well, have a good one to you as well. Um, look, I get the Nick Sirianni frustration, and I'm not going to pretend I was the original thought maker of this here, but when I was driving around, I had on WIP, and I heard someone on the midday show mention that we can look at the Dallas Cowboys, right, and we can see a team that constantly wins, what, double-digit games. Now, this year, they're falling apart. Now, there's news about Dak Prescott hitting the IR. They are tumbling bad, and Real quick, here's a little sidebar. Not too long ago, someone expressed to me, prior to seeing Jalen Hurts play fantastic football again this year, that Howie was wrong to sign him to the contract early. You'd rather be the Dallas Cowboys and wait, 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 wait. Get someone disgruntled if you have to because the last thing you can do is pay someone too early because then you may get this. And this was the beginning of the season. A lot of the turnovers following the Carson Wentz drama, which was the first example of getting money early and then it falling apart in front of your face. And I said, no, 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 no. It's worse to be stuck with everything financially tied to Dak. 60 mil. How he does things that you don't even know about with those contracts and with those deals. It's easier, believe it or not. It's probably easier to pay early cap hit be less than it would if you waited to figure things out more it'd be easier to move that in a deal than it would be Dak at 60 plus mil and dead cap and all that stuff no no that was just a little sidebar but back to the original point what do the Dallas Cowboys do in the regular season year after year outside of this one Win 12 games, right? Get into the playoffs. Then real issues show up. Mike McCarthy is not that great of a coach. Right? If I asked you right now, is Mike McCarthy a good coach? I think majority of people in town would say no. And that's a Super Bowl winning head coach, by the way. Right? So Nick is only an appearance guy. Mike McCarthy has one. That's why the total record stuff, Nick is the winningest coach. Nick has X amount of wins and X amount of seasons. No one's done it like him. I'm showing you an example of a guy who isn't that good, who has a championship and wins double-digit games all the time with the Dallas Cowboys. That doesn't tell me the full story of these coaches. That's why there's still fear. There's still questions. There's still serious concerns about the way Nick Sirianni handles points and handles the game. He is not doing a good enough job being polished on game day with the headset on, feeling out the game. And it's not stupid or not crazy for fans to really wonder if the way he does it is going to put this team in the best position to win playoff games. Maybe it will. Maybe it will. I'm actually not criticizing him as much on the fourth down calls. The idea of going for it. Not necessarily the actual call made. But the idea of going forward on fourth down in enemy territory instead of kicking every field goal, I think I can work with that. And I prefer that. But this whole idea of leaving way too many points off the board, not taking a three-score lead, instead gambling for two points that would still make it a three-point or a three-possession lead if you were to 
kick the extra point, but if you miss the the, the, the two-point conversion, it's, it's stupid. It's stupid. Every time I try and explain how how much I, I hate that one particular call, I start to stumble because I think what's happening is my body starts to shake because I'm so disgusted with the male practice of coaching. My body almost resists it. It doesn't settle. Unfortunately, that's how it goes for me sometimes with this team. It controls my life. It's a disgusting way about living life, but I wouldn't want it any other way. <laughs> Let's take our next call. Yo, what's up, Rhodes? Uh, I, crazy game against the Jaguars. I know there's a lot of emotions around, you know, Sirianni and his coaching and leaving a lot of points on the board. I just, I just, I, I'm with you. But I want you to consider the possibility that it could be, it could be that Nick Sirianni is the greatest coach of all time. Oh, no. And he is intentionally handicapping this team to unleash them in the playoffs. Nobody is, nobody is paying attention to this. But it could be that Nick Sirianni is simply a superior football mind. And he is tanking this team all the way. <laughs> Anyway, love your show, bros. All right, so here's my thoughts as that call starts to be played. Think about where we are. It's amazing. It truly is. The Eagles are 6-2. and two. All they do is win, but they win in ways that frustrate us more than anything we can remember. Nick Sirianni looks so lost that we are now wondering... And I get it. It's tongue-in-cheek. But we are now wondering if he is unleashing something in the postseason and he's doing the bad stuff on purpose, essentially. Oh, man. That's how out of whack he is on the sidelines. How do we have this record? I don't get it. I don't get it. This whole thing, it blows my mind. And I, I want to ask you if this is something I should consider. You can tweet it at me, at Broads81. I know I like to talk to a lot of you on, on X. It's the first time I did that. That made me nauseous. Or if you want to comment down below in the comment section. It was brought up that instead of fighting this, all you need to do is accept it. Accept it. Don't worry about why. Don't think too much. Win, loss. Happy, not happy. And if you attack it like that, the Nick Sirianni experience gets better. And when I hear it, I think, Yeah, but think about what you're doing. It is so insane. And it is so mind-numbing that you have to watch and consume differently or else your brain will explode. Isn't that alone alarming? Isn't that alone giving you the information you need? That something is wildly absurd about this whole Nick Sirianni era. But to his point, if they win, who the hell cares? I don't know if it will allow you to win the ultimate goal. I don't know. This looks and feels different than a few years back. So just because there was once a time where he did have the success, a lot changes. A lot. Knowledge of what's underneath of you, right? Like, well, I guess this is unique because Kellen Moore's offense and Nick Sirianni's offense. But my point was, when teams see how you have all of your winning done, There is an adjustment. We just watched the Jags do something schematically with the tush push. That is development. That is changing the percent rate 
of or the success rate and the percentage of winning that matchup. Teams are starting to play around with some stuff and throw it your way, and now it's your time to counter. So can Nick Sirianni, the way he is now, years removed from when he did have what it took, does he still have what it takes? Or can he not adjust to the league's adjustments? Because that's a huge part of sustained success. Doug Peterson was talking about what Vic Fangio threw his way, and they were not prepared. It was something out of the ordinary. It was something that they didn't anticipate. That's the next layer to this stuff. And we're trying to figure out what is this next wave of the Nick Sirianni identity. While there's core values and beliefs that always stay the same, you can always stay the same. The league catches up to you. And with Nick, he's out of control. And I almost wonder if he's out of control because he's trying his best. Maybe to be that second wave of Nick or not. I don't know. Look, I'm talking out loud here and just trying to figure it out like the rest of us. Unfortunately, if I was to do this until we get the answer, I'd be 69, 70, 71 years old. (laughs) Truly. If I even get to it by that age. This is the type of stuff, though. That last two and a half minutes, three minutes, when it's late at night, when it's 2 a.m. because I drink a fat cup of coffee at maybe 11 o'clock watching Paul George make his debut or watching the Flyers play the Carolina Hurricanes or something like that, that's how my brain works. Maybe it's the same for all of you, and I hope so, so that doesn't mean I'm going psycho. But I go, hmm, now you think about this, and what about that? And, well, with Nick, yeah, but (laughs) Jalen, shut it off, shut it off. I feel like I should have on a straight jacket. What they're what they're doing with Sirianni is he, in the off season he basically got put on a, a pip a, a, a performance improvement plan. So he's already out the door, halfway out the door, and he's just throwing shit at the wall and trying to see what sticks. And we saw that in this game, through this game, and he's not even supposed to be a head coach. Like he's learning on the job at the moment, throwing shit at the wall and seeing what sticks. And yeah, it's it's a bit of an embarrassment. It's a bit of an embarrassment, but. What are we going to do? Are we going to bitch about it every week? I, I don't know, bros. It's, it's, we're in a tough spot. We're in a really tough spot. But I, I think it's even tougher because if we continue to win these games, we continue to have success, and we, and we went win a game or two in the playoffs, I don't know if we get rid of this guy. <laughs> I don't know if we get rid of this guy, bros. I love that call. That almost encapsulates, is that the word I'm looking for? The whole entire spiel I previously went on. Uh, I'm with you, right? But look, if they win two playoff games, then he shouldn't be fired. Right? Like They're not just going to fire him. He shouldn't be fired unless behind the scenes he really does nothing and they know he does nothing. But uh, stop. I'm, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. <laughs> two playoff games. I mean, that could be, uh, at that point, are we talking being in the conference championship? If this team makes the conference championship and loses, Nick Sirianni's here. He is learning on the fly right now. I'm going to be Mr. Emotional. I'm going to be Mr. Passionate. I'm going to be Mr. Personality because that's what the team wants me to be. And that's what I do in the bye week. I self-assess. And then the next game, he beats a garbage team by four and he starts mother effing the guy behind the bench. And then one week later from that, he tells Saquon Barkley, it's not a good idea to get emotional. When you go back to New York, it's not good to have too many emotions. And I'm going one week ago. All you did was prepare to be more emotional, and now you know it's bad for you, and you're telling your team not to do it, yet you're the leader, and you do it all the time. That's our head coach. So he doesn't know who to be, who he needs to be, what he should be. 
It's all throwing things at the wall to see what sticks, as you alluded to. But here they are at six and two. I guess I'm willing to have more fun with it now. Maybe that's what this show is teaching me. Because sometimes I talk my way through things, and then by 30 minutes in, I'm like, huh, well, that changed my perspective. I didn't necessarily go into this wondering if I would accept it. I thought I'd probably rip Howie Roseman longer than I did. And then I figured I'd dabble on the Knicks stuff more. There was a lot of a lot of media members willing to take a step back and 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 maybe revisit the Knicks stuff a little. Where if they were a 10 out of 10 with hate and fire and heat after the game was over, maybe they were more 8 out of 10 because the win masked some of the pain. So they were still on Nick, don't get me wrong, but I don't think it was the same 10 out of 10 the way Monday was for every media member. Some were still pretty rough and stern, but, you know, it definitely took a step back. The last thing I thought I would do was almost accept it. But I'm now contemplating if that's the right way to do it. Lean into it. But is that me getting sucked in again? Is that the first step of me subconsciously opening up my heart and allowing the mayhem that we should already be prepared for, knowing that there's something awkward and strange about the Nick Sirianni experience? You feel this way for a reason. It's normally, think this. All right, I'm sure a lot of you scroll TikTok late at night nonstop, right? And there's women talking about their relationships with their boyfriends or their exes or whatever. And they say, you know, you, you always have that feeling, women. All right, women always know in their gut when the man's cheating and blah, blah, blah. You know it. You know it. You know it. You got to trust your instincts. You know it. They're sneaking around. You know it. The intuition. Once again, questioning if that's the right word I'm looking for. But something tells me the Nick thing, it's off. Something's off. And if I allow the craziness to just happen and accept it because it's easier, and you're driving yourself crazy, is that me subconsciously allowing them to win? And do I allow them to win? (laughs) <laughs> oh man if you made it this far far god bless your soul i mean seriously we'll take one more call and then we'll kind of tie a bow on this puppy Rhodes, i'm going to take a real unpopular stance right now and that is in defense of nick sirianni the only thing i believe he's guilty of in my opinion is believing in his players I mean, you got four minutes and 55 to go in the first half. Fourth and three, the Eagles run a pass to A.J. Brown. He gets the separation he needs to, and Jalen delivers a dud. I mean, you got to have better execution than that. And the two failed two-point conversions, I look at those the same way I look at Bryce Harper always swinging for the fences. We've lived and died by this risk-taking philosophy, and I think we've lived better lives as a result of it. Bryce Harper hits a lot of home runs. We convert that play a lot. Now, I I will give you fourth and inches, questionable play call on that bootleg. But let's not forget, that drive before, Saquon Barkley fumbled, trying to do a little too much, right? Missing easy catches and now fumbling while he's just on his way down. So I think this team is, is so talented that doing the simple things might ultimately break their backs. I don't know what you think. Still won the game. It's Dallas week. Let's get it, Broads. The Dallas week doesn't feel the same when we're playing Cooper Rush, and it, it seems like we've been robbed of what Dallas Eagles is supposed to mean for a while now, dating back to the last eight, nine matchups or so. There's always one backup. There's a few times you got Hurts versus Dak, maybe three times or so off the top of my memory, but majority of them had a, a version of an Eagles backup or Cooper Rush, and you know here we are again with it all. Uh, I don't really blame Saquon for the fumble. Uh, it can't happen. 
happen. Don't get me wrong, but it was more egregious by the league than anything the Eagles did. And, and you have to battle that adversity sometimes. And with this league, they have shown you they are willing to screw up more times than we would like to see. Um, but yeah, I mean, I blame the refs more for that one. And, you know, this is the interesting thing about the going for it on fourth and three and trusting his players. And, you know, the play was open. I, I don't mind the fourth and three. If you remember, though, and, and we're a little bit far removed from it, but I want you to remember the game against Green Bay. What happened? I'll lay it out for you literally as the gameplay says on the ESPN app, just for more context. But essentially, week one, the only reason why you felt good about where you stood against the Green Bay Packers after the first quarter was because you made Green Bay settle for six points. They kicked a field goal at 826. They kicked a field goal at 301. Then in the second quarter, you were able to score a touchdown. Saquon Barkley, 18-yard pass. That was an awesome throw, an awesome catch, and you're up 7-6. You started to feel strong because you allowed Green Bay to march to a certain territory. And then when they got into the wheelhouse of, all right, we can start making decisions. All right, what do we do? How do we, how do we go about this? They settled, settled, settled. Because you don't want to leave, quote, points on the board. But you settling gave the Eagles a life, kept the Eagles involved. Then they ended up, beating the Packers 34-29. And I say that to say, just because you snag a couple of field goals, more times than not, the other team feels better about it than you do. I want to have this offense concern you on fourth down. I, I want you to know that this offense is such a juggernaut that you don't stand a chance to stop them on fourth down. I want to have that level of fear in the other team's eyes because you have the talent to do it. The one big question that will probably save this for another day is how do we really handle this Saquon Barkley carries stuff? Because the numbers are pretty alarming. And I don't know if this is sustainable. You may need them, but I don't know if this is sustainable. We touched on it a little bit at the end of the last pod, but I'm starting to think about it more and more. That's, that's a tough one. That's a tough one, and we'll need more time for that. But I just want to say thank you to everybody who tuned in today. This is going to do it for this particular show. Let me know how you feel about Howie Roseman not making any moves. Let me know how you feel about Nick Sirianni, and is it silly to jump on board and, and just say, screw it. It doesn't make sense, and let's just uh, join the party of it not making sense instead of ripping your hair out, figuring out why it looks this way. I have a very difficult time leaving the party that I'm in now, okay, which is the what is Nick Sirianni train. It's very difficult for me. Love you guys. Appreciate it. You're the best in the world. I'll see you all on the next one.